Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. On February the 26th, 1848, page 5 of the Times contained dramatic news from the continent. The newspaper's editorial staff informed its readers of a bulletin received by Electric Telegraph from Folkestone. Quote, There's been a complete revolution in France, it said, which has terminated in the abdication of the King of the French. The Palais Royal was attacked at 12 o'clock by the people and taken by them at half past one after a sanguinary contest. End of quote. The French opposition declared a republic, and it wasn't long before this revolutionary zeal spread. Within weeks, uprisings had begun in Germany, and soon a wave of revolutions swept across Europe. Italy, Hungary, Denmark and Ireland were all affected. But almost all of these rebellions failed, leaving many countries with regimes even more oppressive than those they'd briefly shaken off. With me to discuss the revolutions of 1848 are Tim Blanning, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Cambridge, Lucy Ryle, Professor of History at Birkbeck, University of London, and Mike Report, Senior Lecturer in History at the University of Stirling. Tim Blanning, let's start by going back a few decades to when the map of Europe was substantially redrawn in 1815 after the Napoleonic War. What the peacemakers tried to do at Vienna in 1814-15, they were at it for more than a year, was to create a, a new order for Europe after virtually a quarter of a century of incessant fighting. It's a very, very complex settlement that they imposed on Europe, and imposed is the word, incidentally, but I think we can pull out maybe four things, four big things. One was to turn France into a stable monarchy, but a weak monarchy, and in that they more or less succeeded. It wasn't very stable because there's a change of dynasty in 1830, but France didn't go to war again until 1854, which was amazing given um, the record of French aggression over the previous two centuries. Secondly, they turned Italy into a dominion of Austria, and there we can give them a big tick. That certainly succeeded, and at least until 1859, with a brief blip, as we shall discover in a moment, in 1848. Thirdly, they had handed over Poland to Russia, and that can be given a great big tick because that continues until 1917, in effect. And then finally, and most importantly, they did not restore the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, the wonderful fragmentation of Germany. Instead, they created a German confederation of 39 states, again, under the dominion of Austria. So it looks as though Austria has come out by far and away the, 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 the winner of this settlement, although with the advantage of hindsight, we can see that they really set up a unification of Germany under Prussia. But that's a long time in the future. These ticks included jamming together countries and areas which didn't like to be jammed together, so they were ticks covering cracks, weren't they? Oh, absolutely, and the cracks were wide in 1815, and the fissures got wider as the decades passed. And I think we can say, with the advantage of hindsight, and historians are good at that, that what, what the peacemakers had failed to do was to take any account of the two great... A powerful ideologies of the period, liberalism and nationalism. There are always many reasons, and historians like to give them in threes, but still there are many reasons for uh, ascribed to the causes of these revolutions in 1848. But can you tell us a bit, Tim Blanning, about the profound social changes revving up to 48? Yes, I, I haven't got a triad. I'm sorry, Melvin, I've only got two <laughs> for you, but they're big ones. The first one is a terrific demographic revolution. Uh, the population of, of Europe increases very rapidly during the 19th century, during the first half of the 19th century especially. If I can just give you one figure to indicate what's happening here, the population of Berlin goes from 175,000 in 1800 to 420,000 by 1848. It's a colossal uh, increase taking place before uh, everyone's eyes. It's a perceived increase. And what's happening there is that as a result of this colossal expansion of population, most especially in the big cities, we've got a downward pressure on wages but an upward pressure on prices. So there's a there's a long-term deterioration in the standard of living for a large number of people living in, in towns. And the other great change which takes place is a massive expansion in the public sphere as a result of an increase in literacy. We the have public sphere mean the number of public enga- who can engage in political discourse. Uh, ex- exactly. There are more educated people, many, many 
many more educated people who can read about public affairs, want to read about public affairs, want to discuss public affairs, want to become involved in public affairs, but they can't in most of continental Europe because there is repressive censorship and a denial of freedom of association or assembly or any of the other civil liberties. Well, we're off to a great start. Uh, Lucy Ryle, Britain had... uh embraced some sort of, well, not embraced, political reform with the Reform Act in 1832. But what was the political situation? Tim has told us, given us good background on the story. What was the political situation in Europe? Well, it is, in fact, exactly as, as Tim has described it. I mean, these, these regimes that are restored in 1815 after the Napoleonic Wars are um, what they call absolutist regimes. In other words, they rest, rest on the absolute power of rulers. There are generally not no constitutions, although there are some parliaments, they have very little power. They're based on press censorship and quite heavy-handed um, policing. So that's that's fine as far as it goes, but actually by the 1830s and definitely by the 1840s, this quite repressive absolutist system is beginning to falter. And it's faltering actually again for the reason that, that, that Tim has just described, in part because of the growth of public opinion and a kind of liberal public opinion, which is bitterly opposed to, these, uh, to this system of government and is demanding liberal reforms and freedom of the press. Um, and these are then also start forming into opposition groups, um, either moderate liberal groups um, or ra- much more radical revolutionary groups. So you've got a very unstable political situation in which these governments are not actually managing to kind of fulfil their obligations or guarantee order in this period. Are you talking about something that is European-wide at this stage? Well, obviously, that's, that, it is a huge generalisation, but these kinds of factors you can see in almost all of the um, European, continental European states, certainly West, Western Europe and Central Europe. Germany and some southern German states, um, the situation is less unstable, but certainly in parts of the Austrian or Habsburg Empire, and most definitely in Italy, um, the regimes by the 1840s are looking really quite unstable. Can you give the listeners some idea of what, a repressive absolutist regime was doing and how it was being repressive and absolutist? Well, in part it was based... Um, it, again, it depends from, 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 well, from state to state. Well, let's take France to start with. Um, well, in part it's about actually cracking down on any sign of, of revolutionary or poli- oppositional political activity so that, in fact, almost all opposition political activity is taking place in kind of cultural um, areas such as in, in clubs... Um, and and so on. There aren't. Um, there is no freedom of the press. So as soon as it has, everything has to go through the censor, and votes. And there's no obviously no voting. I mean, there's very 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 narrow suffrage. It's about less than two percent of the population. So really, there is no kind of. Well, there is no public sphere in in terms of the way we think about it. And this uh, absolutism is enforced very rigorously. Yeah, by the police and if necessary by the army. What were the economic circumstances of the major European powers in... Let's just go to the 1840s now and then run up to 1848. Let's start at the beginning of the 1840s. What's going on? Well, the 1840s is a period, actually, of of really severe economic crisis. You know, we might want to call it a kind of perfect storm in economic terms because you have a series of very, very bad harvests, starting with um, the potato harvest and continuing with the grain harvest. Through the early uh, 40s? Through, yeah, from about 1845 until about 1847. There were two years of very bad harvests. And this leads to um, price rises, fundamentally, which in turn leads to a, a downturn in the, in the trade cycle and unemployment, because essentially people can't afford to buy manufacturing goods anymore. And that, in turn, actually leads to a wave of uh, business bankruptcies, which in turn leads to um, a credit crisis with a number of banks failing across Europe. All of this also uh, must be seen in terms of a much broader picture, which is actually a kind of long and very painful transition from feudal society to capitalist society, if we want to call it that, or certainly a kind of industrialisation and the commercialisation of agriculture. Was the Industrial Revolution, which was very advanced in this country, and and, but, but gaining a grip in continental Europe. Was that a factor too? Did the cities become different places because of this? 
Well, the cities um, are growing very rapidly. Um, again, as Tim said earlier, um, it's partly to do with population, to do with population growth, and partly to do with mi massive migration into the towns. So the cities have become much more overcrowded. Another factor. And the, um, and the, and the, mm -hmm. the, sorry, and the powers that be weren't ready for that. They weren't ready for the sewers, the education, the transport. They had no. They had no way of dealing with them. I mean, an example, a very good example of that, are cholera epidemics in the 1830s, which are very, very frightening, kill an enormous number of people and the governments really have no means of dealing with it because they don't even understand what it, what it is. Mike Rapport, can you, as we come to the final uh, uh, um, lap of reasons for these things happening and such a scale in 1848, is there anything that you would like to add to the reasons for? Well, one is the role of historical memory. Um, Metternich famously said that when France sneezes, Europe catches a cold and the reason behind that is the memory of the French Revolution of 1789. And you add to that a cultural movement, romanticism, where people re remember the French Revolution in, in, in quite idealistic terms sometimes. And revolution for many people is a kind of panacea, that it can somehow transform society and make things better. And a, a part of that is you get the rise of the professional revolutionary. Now, these people don't create the conditions of the revolution. People like Garibaldi, Mazzini, uh, the Italians, uh, people like Louis-Auguste Blanqui in France... Um, but what they do do is they're ready, they're on hand to take advantage of the situation. Mm. And the second point, I think, is that the 1848 revolutions don't come out of the blue. Uh, in, in, in 1746, 1747, and indeed early 1848, before the February Revolution in Paris, you have movements which are already testing the limits of the old order. Uh, there is a peasant uprising in uh, Galicia, in, in what is now uh, the Ukraine, in, uh, in 1846. You get uh, Italians celebrating the election of, of a pope who they thought was liberal, Pius IX. Um, and you get uh, demonstrations in Germany against the, uh, ag against the economic crisis, the hunger marches. So th there are people testing the limits of the old order, testing the capacity of the old order to resist. And have we stressed enough the importance of the new communications? Well, we began the programme by, by saying of the electric telegraph from Folkestone gave the excited news to the Times. Yes, the, the main mode of communication, the most modern, I suppose, or the most widespread was steam power. Um, the, the news, to give one example, the news of the revolution in Vienna when it took place arrived in Venice by the Lloyds steamer from Trieste across the Adriatic. Um, steam power is very important because it speeds up the, the, the news of the, the, of the revolution in Paris, the revolutions in Vienna, revolutions in Berlin, and that, that's what sets the European heather alight, um, is, is, is the rapidity with which uh, the news of revolution spread. Finally, before we move into the revolutions themselves, can we just again, can we define as closely as possible who these revolutionaries were? They, in many ways, if, on a European plane, represent a cross-section of European society. They mean are, including aristocrats and Yes, both in ends. some parts of, of Europe, absolutely aristocracy. Northern Italy, I think, you know, you get the, the nobility, are very disenchanted with Austrian rule, primarily because power isn't being shared. But by and large, you're talking about people who are middle class often. Uh, the leadership is often middle class. They're journalists in particular who are very much engaged with the civil society we've been talking about, uh, disenchanted with the limits of the old order, particularly the political limits. It is the young. Students in particular play an important role, especially in Vienna, uh, in Paris as well, and I believe in Berlin too. But also, above all, the people who do the hardcore fighting on the barricades in the cities are the workers and the artisans, who are in many ways responding to uh, liberal appeals for, for assistance in some respects, but also who are being driven by economic distress and economic despair. Thank you. Tim Blanning, there's already been a few disturbances uh, before he got to Paris, but Paris was the significant uh, revolution in 1848. And as we heard at the beginning of the programme, it seemed to happen in an hour and a half and it was all over. Can you uh, develop that? I can a bit, I think. <laughs> it takes about three days. It's, it's amazing that uh, what appeared to be a really very stable monarchy just, just goes down in flames in, 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 two, in two or three days in February 1848. And then that just lights up the continent. There had been a previous... Uh, previous problems in, in Naples and Sicily, but that wasn't going to do very 
very much. But France and memories of the French Revolution are loom very large in men's minds. A lot of people are still alive who either had first-hand experience of the French Revolution or knew about it from what their parents had told them. So it's, it's a very live issue. Well, now, in France in uh, late 1847, early 1848, but the big issue was the franchise. Um, as Lucy said earlier, it is, it is very limited. It's more limited in France in 1848 than it had been in England before 1832, before the Great Reform Act. We're talking about, actually, my figure, I think it's actually rather less than 1% of the French population being entitled to vote. So there's, there's a lot of agitation in favour of an expansion of the franchise. Not, in, not uh, in, for the least reason, they're encouraged by what had happened in England in the early, in the early, 18, in the early 1830s. Well, now, there's a ban on political demos. So instead, to get round that, they organise, the opposition organises banquets. That's banquets, great, isn't it? Yes, why not? I, mean, this is, I love uh, that bit. Uh, this is Paris, <laughs> yeah. Uh, they like to, like to eat and dine. And when they eat and dine, they also have make political speeches and um, lots of political semiotics and, uh, and so on. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a not very covert political, uh, uh, political demonstration. Anyway, a, a, a banquet due to be held on the 21st of February is banned. There's a demonstration on the streets. It gets out of hand. There's fighting over the next couple of days. The National Guard is mobilised. The National Guard proves to be mutinous. And this is absolutely crucial moment in Paris in February and, by extension, everywhere else in Europe. When the armed forces, the, the, the coercive forces of the state start to crumble, that's when a demonstration turns into an incipient revolution. And in France, there's regime change because the army, uh, the National Guard and the regular army falls apart in King Louis-Philippe's hands. He realises that uh, the time has come and his will collapses uh, and he cuts and runs. He didn't want to end up as his father had on the guillotine. And he makes for England. He, where else does he, where else would he go? Yes. Potters out his life in... Whereabouts? Did he, in London, I suppose. He, he went to... Um, they, um, Claremont was made available for him, wasn't it? I think he ends, he ends, he ends his days in Claremont, in a, 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 a stately home in southern England. <laughs> worst, worst places to end up. So that, that, that happened in France. That sends a big signal around Europe because France, um, Paris being Paris and the French Revolution and so on. And as you've described, Louis Philippe actually fleeing the field, National Guard turning. Lucy Royal, only it. Only a, it's a domino effect, isn't it? It's a very good. Only a few weeks later, the revolutionary sentiment went to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, another massive place. What were the consequences in Vienna, and how did it reach there? Do we see it? Is there an absolutely direct connection? Well, there must be. What is the direct connection? The direct connection is essentially news. Um, news travels much faster um, by the middle of the 19th century, so the news arrives of what's happened in Paris, and when uh, you know Paris sneezes, the rest of the rest of Europe catches the cold. So effectively, the Habsburg Empire catches the cold, but actually very quickly. I mean, if it takes three days in um, Paris, it really takes one day in Vienna. I mean, on the 13th of March. Um, partly as a result of uh, incendiary speeches of the previous week in the Hungarian Diet or Parliament. There is, in fact, there are street demonstrations in, in Vienna, um, starting with students, many of whom are Czech, who are just uh, completely um, fed up with the regime. They go down into the streets and start demonstrating. Uh, they are then joined by um, actually middle, a lot of middle-class professionals, lawyers and shopkeepers and so on. Um, which and when the army tries to disperse these uh, demonstrators, they then take to the barricades and are joined by workers. So the whole thing kind of really spirals out of control, and they then try and march on the imperial palace, demanding the resignation, the resignation of Metternich, the Chancellor of um, Austria, who by the end of the day has given up, has been forced to give up, has been basically dismissed, and, and, and flees Vienna with his wife, and he too uh, ends up in England, and I'm not sure what stately home they give him. I don't quite know what happens to Metternich after 1848. But, but can we pause on mm -hmm. Metternich for a moment? Because I, as I understand it, he was the great architect of the Congress of Vienna, and he was regarded as the great solidifying, central, intellectual, unifying force in Europe. And he goes... Tim, do you want to come for a second yeah. He's, he's the personification of the system which is imposed after 1815. It, it, in many ways, it's most unfair. Uh, Metternich was a conservative rather than a reactionary. Much of what was done in his name in Europe and more, more specifically in the Habsburg Empire did not win his approval. But nevertheless, he, and, and he, he's the personification 
of, of reaction. And he's old by 1848. He's been in charge since 1809. And so it's a combination of someone who is old, moribund, but also repressive is, is, a, is a very... Um, it, 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 it makes people very angry. Lucy, so when he fled, what happened? Well, then there really is a domino effect, because precisely because he is a symbol of the old order, of the Ancien Regime, or the restored regime. At that point, you know, all bets are off, basically. The Conservative order is, has been defeated, and the revolution spreads to Budapest, to um, northern Italy, particularly to um, Venice and Milan. It spreads to Zagreb in the south. It spreads to Krakow in the north. So you actually then have revolution across... Um, the Habsburg Empire, and eventually spreading it into the German states as well. So it's really the end, the fall of Metternich, or it seems to be the end of the old regimes. Let's dig to another big beast, Germany, Mike Rapport. What happened there? Well, two things. Uh, first of all, the news of the revolution Are we talking, in Paris. just to keep the listeners... We're talking about a matter of weeks here. Uh, you know, two weeks later, this happened. Two weeks later, Indeed. that happened. It's going... Blah, 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 blah. But, right, right. That's right. Germany, I mean, from yeah. late February to mid-March. I mean, it's, right, it is yeah. a matter of a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, two things happened. First of all, the news of the revolution in Paris uh, d- brings Euro- uh, German radicals and, and liberals out onto the streets, uh, demanding constitutional change, demanding constitutions, civil rights in Western Germany. The last state to topple is Prussia, with its capital in Berlin. It is the most powerful state in Germany alongside Austria. Uh, So it's very, very important for that reason. And the revolutions in Germany act at two levels. The national level, because German liberals, the revolutionaries, want German unification. But also at the state level, and each state has its own mini-revolution, if you like. But the most important one, uh, in German terms, is actually the, the revolution which occurs in Berlin. And it's very, very violent, very bloody. It is one day of very intense violence, but 900 people are killed, 800 of them on the insurgent side. And the end of the day? End of the day, the king promises vaguely a constitution for Prussia, and he also promises vaguely that he will support the movement for German unification, and he will use Prussian power to help achieve that. Do the revolutionaries at the end of that day think they've won? Yes, uh, there is what one French historian once called the lyrical illusion, the sense that we, we've achieved this and we've, we've achieved this through social unity, middle class people, work, working class people on the barricades together, and that somehow this is the dawn of a new era. There is a suspicion, however, amongst liberals that, that the victory isn't entirely complete, that the, the monarchies who have been cowed are not actually broken or defeated entirely. Let's stay in this moment, Tim Lanning. The, the, the revolution after revolution after revolution in all these great cities that this is talked about, you've talked about. Um, why did it spread? And did they feel that they got there, that it had been ready to topple and they just pushed it with their forefinger and down it had gone? Was yes, this exhilaration throughout Europe? Exhilaration is a very good way of describing it. Yes, it's a combination of exhilaration on the part of the insurgents and a collective collapse of nerve on the part of the regimes. For the past generation or more, Metternich had been telling anyone who, had been, who would listen that Red Revolution was just around the corner unless they repressed every sign of political dissent. And so when there is this very rapid collapse of the regime in Paris and Louis-Philippe did abdicate, did flee, a republic was established, all the other rulers in Europe thought, oh my God, it's going to happen to us unless we, unless we make concessions. So right across uh, central, eastern, southern Europe, concessions are made. Liberal regimes are introduced. Um, civil liberties are granted. And so there's a, a, a general feeling across Europe in the springtime of the peoples that the spring had arrived both literally and metaphorically and the old order had collapsed. They were wrong. It is extraordinary, isn't it? It, I mean, it is. Just to contemplate it, these 20 or 30 uh, cities and just collapsing like that at that particular time. Um, Lucy, um, there had been um, an in, uh, a very early uh, revolution, even before Paris, in Sicily, and then it had spread up, as it were, north anyway, into Italy. And the Italian Revolution got underway. We're going from country to country. This is a historical history as a travel tour, as well as everything else. But Italy was very, uh, very substantially involved. Yeah, actually, as so often, um, Italy is a harbinger of what is to come. And in fact, in a way, the revolution started in 1846 in Italy with the election of this Pope, Pius IX, who everyone has such um, liberal expectations in. But the real uh, moment is first... Were their expectations realised? 
Um, initially, at the very beginning, but by the spring of 1848, he's already disappointed everybody. Um, but uh, they hope he's a liberal pope and also he's an Italian pope or he's going to help unify Italy. Um, and these, ex one, the ex these expectations are one reason why you start getting disturbances in Milan because there is a um, tobacco strike um, in protest at the tax on tobacco and great resentment against Austrian soldiers who wander around Milan smoking in people's faces. But more importantly uh, is, are the events in early January in Palermo when there is a kind of uh, an urban riot which rapidly spreads into the countryside and the government and the troops completely lose control of what's going on in Sicily, retreat to the mainland, but the riots also spread to the mainland and in Naples and the, in uh, early middle of January there is a constitution granted by the king. This then spreads also further north um, and constitutions are granted in the Papal States by the Pope, in Tuscany by the Grand Duke of Tuscany and in most importantly of all in Piedmont Savoy by the King of Piedmont. Important because they had a standing army, didn't they? Important because they had a standing army, important because this is the one statute, the one constitution in Italy that remains after the end of the 1848 revolutions and important because Piedmont is about to thereafter um, have an incredibly important role in the future of Italy. So it's, a, it's almost like some sort of forest fire, isn't it, really? We, let's just continue for a little while. Mike Rapport, over to you for Hungary. Yes, Hungary is an interesting case because it's one which actually, at least at the initial outbreak, isn't that violent. The news of Metternich's um, dismissal, or rather resignation, arrives in Budapest the day afterwards. So we were talking about the 14th of March. Now, Hungary is already in ferment. Uh, there are two reasons for this. First of all, there is a radical movement which has met clandestinely in Budapest demanding or drawing up a program for uh, dramatic political reform, a, a constitution, elections, civil liberties. Um, but there's also already a parliament meeting, the Hungarian Diet. And it is in there that the radical leader, uh, Leos Kossuth, had pronounced, uh, given a great speech, which pretty much warns the Habsburg monarchy that it has to reform, otherwise it will fall apart. And it is that speech which is translated into German, uh, and sent to Vienna, which in many ways galvanizes the Vienna, Vienna crowd uh, in, in the revolution there. So th there's a kind of a, a cycle. But when the news of Metternich's fall comes, it is the radical movement in Budapest which assembles a large crowd, about 20,000 people by some counts, marches on the castle in Buda and demands constitutional change. And there is, by this stage, a total lo loss of confidence by the uh, authorities. They've heard about Metternich's resignation, and apparently the some accounts say that these people on both sides are trembling, because they're not sure what's going to happen. And they, 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 they grant Hungary constitutional change. So when you say they want these changes, can you just spell out, say, the three or four major changes that the uh, revolutionaries are asking for, demanding? Greater autonomy within the Habsburg Empire. They but don't right want full Europe, independence. They, oh, right across Europe. Constitutions. So they want not necessarily democracy, but they want legisl uh, le legislative government. They want representative government. They want civil liberties, especially freedom of the press. And an interesting one is that most of these movements want a citizen's militia because they don't trust the regular army. They believe it's, it's in the hands of the, of, of the conservative governments. Now, Jim Lanning, we could go on to Denmark, Poland and Ireland and so on. Um, and, and it did. But what do the newspapers say? What's opinion saying about this around the place? Is there huge excitement and the world is changing or the end of the old world, the beginning of the new Yes, well, there was great excitement, um, but one needs to remember, and th we, we, w this is really signalling a pretty quite important qualification to what we've been talking about so far. We've really talked in as if it were the case that everyone in Europe wanted revolutionary change, but it's not like that at all. The public sphere is a neutral vessel uh, in which all shades of opinion could sail and did sail. And so in 1848, it's not only liberals and nationalists and radicals who come to the fore, but it's also clericals, Catholic cler clericals and conservatives and people that we would regard as seriously reactionary. So there's, there's a real maelstrom of opinion uh, right across the whole spectrum from right, from, from right to left. So in, to answer your question, in the newspapers, which, which flood past now that censorship has been, has been removed, that, 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 that flood into the public sphere, every conceivable kind of uh, 
uh, of opinion is being ventilated right from the extreme left. This is a time when Karl Marx is is very busy in Cologne, uh, right to the to the extreme right, where we've got uh, uh, reactionary Prussian Junkers with setting up their own newspapers to put their views their views across. It's by no means unanimous. Um, there's no consensus in 1848. That's really what I'm getting at. Luther, uh, these other countries that I've just... We haven't time to go to all of them. Was anything new... Ha- <clears throat> did anything new happen in any of them that would add to the conversation? Well, I mean, I think probably the, interest, the most interesting <coughs> country in some respects is actually Britain. Um, I'm coming to that later. Yeah. I'm talking about those that, which did have revolutions. Which did have revolutions. And Poland, Denmark, um, Ireland. I attempted. There's Denmark is, yeah. is important in this, especially for the German context, because the Danish monarchy actually signs away absolutism even before the revolution takes place. Late February, they say, well, we'll give up. We'll have a constitutional monarchy. The thing is, is that that stirs up Danish nationalism. Um, it encourages the Danish nationalists who enter a dispute with the German liberals in March and April 1848 over the Schleswig-Holstein duchies, which are those borderland duchies between Denmark and Germany. And that erupts into conflict in April 1848. And it is one of the things, in the end, which saps uh, the, the liberal revolution in, in Germany. Now, Lucy has mentioned, and uh, we said at the beginning of the program, there were exceptions to this, and, and two of the exceptions were Britain and Russia. Why was that? You do Britain, and then Lucy can do Russia. Well, Britain, because, uh, as Tim said earlier, there, there had already been constitutional concessions made, the 1832 Reform Act. But isn't it a bit surprising that they didn't say, let's join in and have more concessions? Yes, well actually there was a Chartist movement which uh, demanded universal male suffrage amongst other things and they did organise a monster demonstration, I think they called it at the time, to march on Parliament and present a petition for parliamentary reform. But it was turned out to be a bit of a damp squib and it's partly because the Chartist movement itself had contradictions within it. They, they, they talked about peaceful protests, but some radicals, hotheads, talked about revolutionary methods. And in the end, uh, the authorities were pretty robust in, in, in facing it down. Lucy wants to say something, but Tim first. And then or, just, just to add, I, I think the, the, the British system survives because it showed it could... It, it could reform itself from within. So in the 1840s, uh, the Anti-Corn Law League had secured the um, repeal of the, of the Corn Laws. It was, uh, and Queen, it's very also very important that Queen Victoria was a young, attractive, almost one might say charismatic monarch. She had lots of legitimacy in her tank as compared with most of the um, Cretans who, who ruled the um, continental monarchy. So uh, England is, uh, Great Britain, United Kingdom one should say, is, is a special case in that in that. In but that there was sense. a revolution in Ireland, we can't, was, which is then part of Britain, as it were. Not in 1848. Yes, there, yes, there is. Yes, there, there is. is, yes. there there is, is an a, attempted um, revolution. An in attempted Ireland. revolution. People yeah. call the Confederates of all things. They they rise up, and they're, but it's it's put down very very quickly. So it doesn't qualify um, as a real revolution, squib. Tim. But it's a squib revolution. But we're nearly there. What about Russia? Well, I Russia? wanted to just say that I actually think in some ways the revolution in Ireland is is actually quite important. I mean, it. it <laughs> Uh, and a lot of these revolutions are squibs, but actually there is there is huge opposition in Ireland to British rule. So I think there is a kind of way in which we can't completely write that off. There's always a way that we like to say that Britain is different, but actually there are similar uh, uh, problems developing in Ireland. In Russia, actually it's in a way more simple still. It's uh, because there is, on the one hand, um, very effective repression if we think about what we said already about the the governments in early 1848 losing control of the situation in Russia they simply don't lose control of the situation because they crack down very very quickly and uh, the army is really very effective in doing that um also because i think probably there is simply uh, not not quite so much a kind of same development of political opposition and of, of inter- particularly intellectual opposition to um, the regime. So there's, on the one hand, the government is stronger. On the other hand, the political opposition is weaker. So you just don't have the same possibilities, basically. We have the a situation in Italy, which becomes, as it were, in a way, the most interesting. We have Mazzini and Manin and most of all Garibaldi. Can we just refer to Italy for a moment? You and then Tim. Well, I think what happens in Italy is, in fact, incredibly interesting, partly because it shows that the revolutions don't end in 1848, but there's a second wave in 1849. Also, may I interject for one second? It also shows that influences are coming from South America. Garibaldi himself came from from South America, which had had successful revolutions against Spain in the 1820s, and they brought those ideas across to Europe. It's that way traffic, isn't it? It's that way traffic, in fact, and particularly what Garibaldi brings over from um, 
uh, um, South America is this idea of volunteer armies. And these volunteer armies play actually a very large role in, um, in the greatest kind of revolution in Rome in the end, which is in 1849, which is the resistance of the Roman Republic to French invasion. So I think that in a way 1849 is very interesting because there is this second more radical wave of revolutions, um, and uh, this actually there's also there's a there's a, a over, the overthrow of the Grand Duke in Tuscany and the resistance of um, Venice to uh, Austrian invasion. Now we've got to talk about failure because they failed most of them. Obviously, Tim Blanning was there any very very quickly. We're talking about a few months and uh, they're, they're finished now, well, and it's worse than it was before. Well, can you talk about that? Why did they fail, and why was the pattern so similar in their failure? Sure, perfect bridge from what Lucy's just been saying about it. Italy, because it's in Italy that the counter-revolution scores its first major success. Uh, General Field Marshal Radetzky, who was in charge of Austrian troops, does something very sensible in March, April 1848. He withdraws his troops from Milan. He hands it over to the insurgents. He pulls his troops back to the fortresses for the quadrilateral. He then purges his units of any, um, a- any soldiers who are thought to be unreliable. And when he's pared it down to a mainly German or Hungarian or Croatian-speaking uh, army, he sallies forth and then proceeds to crush the Italian insurgents supported by the Piedmontese army at Custozza on the 22nd of July 1848. And that, we can say, with the advantage of hindsight once more, is the beginning of the end for the revolutions of 1848 because it showed that when the insurgents, however enthusiastic and revolutionary they might have been, when they ran into the disciplined firepower of an old regime army, they were defeated. They, 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 they fell apart. And that happens again and again and again. Can you tell us, Mike Report, how it happened again and again and again? Well, the revolutions actually, in a sense, self-destruct from within as well. Um, th- there is a political polarization between liberals who are quite happy with the concessions wrung out of governments in February, March 1848, primarily political reform. But there are radicals who want to push the revolutions further and they want to push the revolution towards social reform, wholesale social reform. And this, in a sense, polarizes the revolution from within, between left and right, or moderates and and radicals. And that provides the opportunity for conservatives to strike back, because the liberals in the end are confronted with this choice. Do you stick to your revolutionary principles, but therefore give the radicals the opportunity to push the revolution to further ends? To, fur- to, to, to radicalise the revolution further. and therefore Which you would find unacceptable. You which is, a, if you're a liberal, you as a middle-class liberal, that, find that unacceptable. That's a nightmare, because yeah. it may entail the redistrib- redistribution of property, it may entail what people thought of as anarchy, chaos, bloodshed. So, like increased male suffrage. Yes, precisely, but also social reform, socialism, these sorts of ideas are knocking around. And in the end, who can actually provide the security against that it is the conservatives, because in many parts of, of Europe, the monarchies still retain control of the armed forces. So that, to take up Tim Blanning's point, Lucy, Lucy Ryle, the it was the monarchy, some of them had flipped, uh, flitted away, but the monarchy, the establishment, they got the armies and they took control, and it was that that did it. They just... Got re- got reorganised very quite quickly, really, and turned on these revolutionaries. Yeah, I mean, on one level, they'd suffered no more than a kind of temporary loss of nerve in early 1848, and they got their nerve back, and they and they set about reconquering Europe. But actually, I'm not sure I entirely um, agree with what's been said in the sense that I think there were actually kind of examples of really quite strong and heroic resistance by the revolutions uh, to the reconquest by by conservatives, notably in southern Germany and particularly in Rome in 1849 and in Venice. Um, and I think that in, in my, what that, re- that resistance is extremely important, um, in part because it shows to the rest of the world how repressive these governments are. And I think it kind of strikes a blow against these regimes, nevertheless, from which they never recover. I mean, it gives them a bad name. If we look at the um, newspaper reporting from the Roman Republic, in the summer of 1849, again and again and again, it's being said, you know, the Pope is repressive, the Pope doesn't care for his people, the Pope is bombarding his own people. This is not the future of Europe as 
as as we want it. So I think it actually, in some respects, this repression that we've been talking about, this failure, uh, in some ways discredits the Conservatives and actually gives a lot of kudos and an air of heroism to the revolutionaries, despite, despite the failure. Yeah, but in, in real politic, if I might use that word, the fact is repressive governments came back more repressive than they'd been before and held on for quite a while. Yes, a few did. decades. Even I, not, you're going to talk about lasting effects and so on, but the, the first effect for for a generation, 25, 30 years, was bad for those who for the the people in the uh, the mass. Yes, I, w- I I wouldn't put it quite as long as that. I don't think the time scale is quite as long. If we can take. Um, uh, the Habsburg Empire, where the repression was at its greatest, uh, there was really very serious repression in Hungary in 1849, um, and there they tried to rule after 1849 in a neo-absolutist way. That's actually what it was called, neo-absolutismus, um, but it, 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 it collapses. They can't work it by the end of the 1850s, just within 10 years. It's, it's, no, it's falling apart. They cannot run a state of that complexity without some degree of popular support and legitimacy. And so by 1859, 1860, the whole thing is falling apart again. So, uh, Mike, <coughs> Mike Rapport, can you tell us briefly what, what were the positive outcomes of this revolution? Well, there are positive outcomes. I mean, they, uh, first of all, the abolition of serfdom in Central and Eastern Europe, outside Russia and, and Poland and Romania, but serfdom where it exists gets abolished. In the French colonies, there's the abolition of slavery. That emancipates 150,000 people. Uh, there are constitutions do survive in two key states, Prussia and Piedmont. Those are the two states which lead the drive for unification in Germany and Italy, respectively. And also you get a mobilization of people. I mean, the the myth of the revolution, if you like. And these things are remembered. And you get the entry of people into politics, often for the very first time, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. The idea of the masses cannot be ignored, Lucy, is now part of the political sphere. Absolutely right. I mean, it creates a model of political participation that in some respects is still with us. Street demonstrations, um, um, a journalism in exactly the way in which we, in many ways we still see it today. And I think all of this is really created by the um, 1848-49 revolutions to no small extent. Also... Um, uh, last year, when they celebrated 160 years of the unification of Italy, what does the Italian president actually chose to emphasise? He chooses to emphasise the Roman Republic of 1849. And so it creates this very lasting memory of popular participation, which I think is extremely important. And last word, Tim Lund? The most important effect result of 1848 was the election of Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte as president of the French Republic in December 1848. That meant that led to the Crimean War, it led to the unification of Italy and led to the unification of Germany and to the defeat of France in 1870. That's quite a lot we're going on with. <laughs> well, we have said quite a lot to be going with. I'm quite exhausted. <laughs> I've been around Europe with three brilliant people. <laughs> In 1848, I shall quietly re-enter. <laughs> what are we, 2012? Thank you very much, Lucy Ryle, Tim Blanning and Mike Rapport. And next week, we'll be talking about the scientific method. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this BBC podcast, why not try others, such as The Forum, the discussion programme about global ideas. To find out more, visit bbcworldservice.com forum.